I'd like to begin with a story. A certain man was traveling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, where he fell among robbers and thieves, who beat him and stripped him and left him half dead. By chance, a priest was passing that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side of the road. Likewise, a Levite, when he too came to where that man was lying in the road, he also passed by on the other side. But then a Samaritan. When he came and saw the man lying in the road, he felt compassion. And seeing the man, he bandaged his wounds, treating them with oil and wine. He placed him on his own animal. And he walked to the nearby inn in the near town. And there he cared for the man all night long. And in the morning he went to the innkeeper and gave him two denarii and said, whatever else it takes, I'll pay it when I return. Most of us have heard this story. Some of us have heard it quite recently. But we need to understand that this story was not told in a vacuum. In fact, there in Luke chapter 10, where we find Jesus teach us this parable, we understand that Jesus taught this parable in answer to a question. A question from a lawyer. And so we need to expand our understanding of this story to grasp what was going on around it that caused Jesus to tell the story. You see, a lawyer came to Jesus and asked him, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus turned the question back on him and said, well, what, what does the law say? How does that read to you? And the man said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, that's it. Do this and you will live. But the man said, oh, but who is my neighbor? And when he asked that question, that is when Jesus gave us the story of this benevolent Samaritan. It was an answer to that question. Who is my neighbor? In essence, the lawyer was asking, who do you love? Who do I have to love? I know that the law says, love your neighbor, but I don't know who my neighbor is. I would be glad to fulfill this law if someone could clarify to me who my neighbor is. And so tonight, as we consider this story, I want us to think in these terms. I want us to answer this question, to consider it. Who do we love? Who is our neighbor? Who are we supposed to love? As we go through this series and we talk about love and good deeds, who is it we're supposed to be doing those things for? That's the question that Jesus was answering. Before we look at that, would you bow with me in prayer, please? Almighty God and Father in heaven, you are the great and awesome God, ruler of heaven and earth. You are the one who has created all things. You are the one who sustains all things. You have done so much good for us. First and foremost, above all things, you have sent your son to die for us, giving us life through him and through his blood, forgiveness and freedom from sin. And we are amazed and we are humbled and we long to love you in return. But as if that were not enough, you have continued to bless us richly and greatly with daily life, food that we eat and air that we breathe, clothes that we wear, cars that we drive in, a place to gather here with brothers and sisters to worship and praise you and to edify one another, to spur one another on. You've given us your word that we can read and understand so that we can bring glory to you. And Father, you've challenged us with this story that we're opening tonight. Help us to... Read that to be challenged and to encourage one another by your grace to fulfill it, to love our neighbor. Help us this week as we strive to grow and to be strengthened and to deepen our relationship with you by deepening our relationship with others. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for being our God. Thank you for letting us be your people. We love you so much, Father. Thank you for loving us first. It's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. As we consider this and the question that the lawyer asked, let's back up and, and ask ourselves this. What kind of question 
was the law you're asking. When he said, who is my neighbor? When he asks, who do you love? What kind of question is it that he's asking? What kind of answer does he expect to receive from Jesus? What's he looking for here? You may be aware that the lawyers were not lawyers in the sense that we think of them today, those who would go before judges and try cases. Lawyers were folks who studied God's law, who knew the ins and outs, who dotted the I's and crossed the T's, who answered questions from the common man about how to follow and obey God's law. They would study for patterns and for concepts and for connections to figure out exactly what they needed to do, how far was too far, how far they had to go, how much was too much, how little was too little, when they had to do this, when they didn't have to do that. Those are the kind of questions that they asked and they answered. They were the kind of people who figured out how far you were supposed to travel on a Sabbath day journey. You know, it, it shocks me. Are you aware that a Sabbath day journey is not actually mentioned in the law? It's not actually there. We often read it like, oh yes, they had a... No, no, the lawyers figured that out. They decided as they went through the law that there was only a certain distance that they were allowed to travel on a Sabbath day before they had violated the law. They were the ones that figured out when it comes to tithing, and how you should deal with your spices even. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two. That's, that's the kind of legalism and law abiding that they would follow. They were the ones that determined that even though the law had said that you could give someone who was being punished 40 lashes, ah, I might miscount. And so I want to make sure that I don't do that. So we're going to say only 39. These were the kind of questions they asked, and these were the kind of questions they answered. And when the lawyer says, who is my neighbor, he is expecting that kind of answer. Oh, I know I'm supposed to love God, and I'm supposed to love my neighbor. Now tell me, who are the people that really are my neighbor? Can you figure that out? Is it the people who are a part of my tribe? Is it the nation of Israel? Maybe it's just the people who live within a Sabbath day journey of me. Who are my neighbors that I have to love? And in fact, that's what I want us to understand, that really when he's asking who is my neighbor, he's really asking this question. Do I have to love that guy? Do I have to love that person over there? Surely, I know I can't possibly love every person in the world, so would you please possibly limit it down to the few people that I know I have to love? And in essence, really what you get there is he's actually asking can I get away without loving them? Can I get away without loving them? Who are the ones that I have to love in order to go to heaven? We can understand when we look at the entire world, that's a lot of people. And so, even if we're just looking at our entire community, that's a lot of people. And I can understand why a lawyer might ask, well, who, who really is my neighbor? Because Jesus, look, God can't possibly expect me to love everybody. Can we limit this down a little bit? Can we, can we make the circle a little bit smaller? Can you let me know who the exact ones are that I have to love? Because once you've convinced me which ones I have to love, I'll love them. Because I want life. I want life, and I am going to do whatever it takes to get life. So you prove to me which ones are the ones I actually have to love. I'll love them. That's the kind of question the lawyer is asking. And that's the kind of answer that he's looking for. But Jesus doesn't give him that kind of answer. Instead, he gives him a story. And to be honest with you, the story doesn't answer the question, at least not to my satisfaction very much. Instead, it just leaves me with more questions and more challenges. And I know it's going to do the same for you every time I ever preach on this on the way out. Somebody asks, well, what about, the, do I have to do this? Every time I see somebody asking for money, do I have to give them some money? Every time I, I see somebody pulled over to the side of the road, do I have to? Those are the kind of questions we ask. And I'll just be honest with you, Jesus does not give us a straight, clear answer on that. What he does is he gives us a story and he gives us a challenge. And he tells us about a man who was passing down the road and he saw someone in need and he felt compassion for him. That's what he tells us. It's a tough answer to this question. It's not what the lawyer wanted to hear. And it's probably not what most of us want to hear because. Frankly, as much as I hate to admit it, I'm a lot like the lawyer. Would, Lord, would you just make this easy? Tell me the five people I have to love, and I'll love them. But it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that at all. Jesus tells a story, and frankly, it's a very shocking story. I'd like you to think about how shocking it is. In fact, a lot of us may not be fully aware of how shocking it truly is. 
many of us know that the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along. The Samaritans were a group of people that had, well, they had kind of a halfway religion. The issue with the Samaritans, by the way, was not as we commonly speak about their race or the fact that there was intermarriage per se. It was about the fact that there was interfaith, there was interreligion. You can find out about the Samaritans in 2 Kings chapter 17. You see what happened when Assyria came in and conquered Israel. They took all but the poorest of the land and they removed them out to other lands. And then they brought other people from those other lands and dropped them in Israel. But they were not worshiping Yahweh when they came into that land. And so Yahweh sent lions among them and started eating them. And, and they cried out to their captors and said, Oh, the God of this land is destroying us. Please help us. And so they got some of the priests of Israel to come back and to teach them about Yahweh. Did they follow Yahweh completely? Absolutely not. They just added him into their pantheon of gods for some reason. God allowed that, at least in the sense of not continuing to send the lions. And I think what we learn from that is that what God wanted to make sure was that his name was remembered in his land. He had plans, and he wanted to make sure that his name would be remembered in his land. And so that's what he makes happen. As time goes on, Judah gets taken captive. They go into Babylon. Then later, they're all released. Judeans and Israelites who were still in that captivity were allowed to come back to their homeland. They want to build the temple. And those folks who were in the land that the Assyrians had brought back, who worshipped Yahweh along with all the other gods, they wanted to be involved. But the Jews understood something. Oh, no, no. No, this house is for those who will worship Yahweh and Yahweh alone. If you're not going to forsake all other gods, you don't get to be a part of this. And so they refused. And from that moment on, the Samaritans and the Jews despised one another. The Samaritans, of course, saw the Jews as exclusivists who thought they were the only ones that were serving God properly. And the Jews saw everybody else as folks who were compromisers against God. They saw all those Samaritans as compromisers. And so it's absolutely shocking that the hero of this story ends up being a Samaritan. But that's not all that is shocking about this story. Are you aware of the major divisions among the Jews, the sects, the groups, the parties that had been formed? There were two of them that you might have heard of throughout your study of Scripture, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees were separatists. The Pharisees were those who wanted to follow God's law and they wanted to follow it purely and they wanted to be separate from Rome and separate from the Hellenism that was going on in the world around them. And so they they got into God's law and said the way we're going to have salvation is by getting into God's law, by doing exactly what He said, by separating ourselves from the world and the culture around us. Lawyers were generally Pharisees. So the person who's asking this question is from that Pharisaic background that wants to serve the Lord because he wants life. Sadducees were people who did not believe in the spiritual, in the resurrection. Luke chapter 23 and verse 28, it tells us that. In Acts, we're told about that. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. Paul, when he was on trial in the middle of a room of Pharisees and Sadducees, he cried out and said that I... I'm on trial for the hope of the resurrection because he knew that that would get the Pharisees and the Sadducees arguing with one another. Here's the fascinating thing. Guess where, in general, priests and Levites fell on this spectrum? They had a tendency to be Sadducees. In Acts chapter 4, in Acts chapter 4, notice this, Acts chapter 4, verse 1. As they were speaking to the people, that's Peter and John, after they've healed the lame man. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Notice that it was the Sadducees and the priests that were together. In verse 5, on the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. We recognize that the priests and the Sadducees... Now, I'm not trying to say that every priest was always a Sadducee. It's hard for me to believe that John the Baptist's father was a Sadducee. However, what we find is that in general, the priests and Levites were in that party. And so, when the Pharisee lawyer is hearing this story, we need to think about what he's hearing. As Jesus tells this story, he says to him, there was a man 
going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's beaten, he's robbed, he's left there, and along comes a priest. What's the Pharisee going to think about this priest? Ah, priest. Probably a Sadducee. He doesn't believe in the resurrection. Remember, remember what the question was that started this? What must I do to inherit life? Ah, Sadducees, they don't even ask that question. They don't believe in the resurrection. Well, obviously, obviously when a priest comes along the road, when he sees this man, he's not going to worry about loving his neighbor. He doesn't care. He's not worried about inheriting eternal life. And then along comes a Levite. Ah, yes, again, one of those Sadducee Levites. He's obviously not going to be the hero. He doesn't care about eternal life. He's not worried about who he's supposed to love and who he's not supposed to love. Now imagine what he's expecting, because we all know in every story that's ever told, it's, it's the law of threes, right? The third guy is going to be the hero. We know who's going to come along next, right? We've got these two Sadducees, a priest and a Levite. And now what do you think this lawyer is expecting to be next? Ah, yes, a Pharisee, a lawyer like himself, concerned about eternal life and the resurrection, and he's going to hear something about that man. And instead, it's a... Samaritan. Now, how does that happen? So I want to think about this in terms that we might think of it today. Terms that we might think of it. Imagine if this story was being told today in a way that would, that would bring this across to us. There was a man who was driving down the road from Orlando to Altamont Springs. And when he got to the stop sign, Somebody tapped on his window, pulled out a gun, and carjacked him. Pulled him out of the car, pistol whipped him, left him on the side of the road, robbed him, beat him. He's laying there in his own blood. By chance, one of those Christians who believes that you're only supposed to drink from one cup at the Lord's Supper comes by. And seeing that man, he passed by on the other side of the road. Likewise, a little time later, one of those Christians who believes that it's okay to use instruments in our worship of God. He too seeing the man pass by on the other side of the room. But then, sometime later, a Muslim. And seeing the man on the side of the road, he pulled over ripped up his own jacket, bandaged the wounds, put him on his own leather seats carried him to the clinic, the hospital, the emergency room, brought him in, carried him in, blood all over his clothes, and he brings him to the doctor, and he goes to the financial office, and he tells them, listen, I, I don't care if he's got insurance or not. When this is done, I'm going to pay for it. That's the story. That's the shocking story of the Samaritan. That's what they heard. That's what we need to hear. The love of a neighbor. But did you pick up Jesus' question at the end of this? At the end of all this, Jesus tells a story, and he has a question. There in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, at the end of the story, in verse 36, Jesus says, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Who proved to be a neighbor? Now that's interesting. That's an odd way of asking the question. In fact, it shocks me because it's similar to the question that the lawyer asked, but it's different. Do you remember what the lawyer's question was? The lawyer's question is, who is my neighbor? That's not the question Jesus asked. He doesn't turn around to me. He says, okay, so who's your neighbor? He asked, who proved to be a neighbor? Quite literally, who became, who qualified as the neighbor? And here's the frightening thing that this tells me. What Jesus is highlighting to the lawyer is, lawyer, you asked the wrong question. You're asking, who is my neighbor? Who is the person that I have to love? The question, lawyer, that you should be asking is, how do I prove to be neighborly? Rather than trying to figure out which one I have to love and which one I don't have to love, I should instead be asking, how do I become 
a person who loves. And isn't that so much the problem that we often have? I know it's the problem I have. I know that at times I, you know, I'm trying to, boy, it is just, it's so hard. It's so tough. Boy, if you could just make this easier, can you just tell me which things do I have to do? Which things do I not have to do? Where do I draw these lines? And what Jesus challenges is to cross those lines. It's not who is my neighbor, but how do I prove to be a neighbor? Of course, the lawyer could hardly even answer the question. Maybe, maybe I'm seeing too much in this, but you know, if he'd been asking me, I would have just said, well, it was the Samaritan. But the lawyer couldn't even say that. Instead, it's, well, the one who showed him mercy. And so, I need to be asking, how do I show myself merciful, compassionate? That's the question we should be asking. Not who do you love, but how do you love? We will talk more about that tomorrow night. That's the question we need to be asking. But if you're like me, you're still left with this. Okay, fine, great, I get it. Jesus is telling the lawyer, you asked the wrong question. You should be asking, how do you prove to be a neighbor? But still, who is my neighbor? I can't love everybody. So who is it that I have to love? I'd like you to think through this answer that Jesus has given, and I'd like you to put yourself in the lawyer's shoes. There's something natural that happens whenever we hear a story. Whenever we hear a story, what the person hearing it automatically does is put themselves in the shoes of somebody that's in the story. It just happens. It's just natural that it happens. And so let's walk through this and think about this the way the lawyer would hear the story and where he puts himself in the story and so what it would mean for him. Well, obviously, the lawyer's never going to see himself as the Samaritan because those dirty, rotten Samaritans, they don't worship God in the proper place. They don't worship God in the proper way. They don't even worship the proper God alone. I, I am not a Samaritan. I'm a lawyer. But he's not going to see himself as the Levite or the priest either because they're probably those Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. They wouldn't even be asking this question that I'm asking right now. And I am certainly not the thieves and robbers. Those guys don't care about God's law. I'm not going to do that. I know there's a law against that. Thou shalt not steal. I'm not going to do that. So where does that leave me? The one that he would most likely put himself in the shoes. The man that's beaten and robbed. Did you notice that God does not give us, or excuse me, Jesus does not give us any details about who that man is? Maybe he was a Levite or a priest. Maybe he was a lawyer. Maybe he was a Samaritan. Jesus doesn't actually tell us anything about that guy. And what that does is it makes that guy the one that we most commonly put ourselves in his shoes. We're that guy. And so, when I understand that the most natural place that the lawyer sees himself in the story is the fellow who's beaten on the side of the road dead and he's asking, who is my neighbor? I suddenly figure out that Jesus' answer is, I don't know, lawyer. Who would you want to be your neighbor if roles were reversed? If you were the one on the side of the road having been beaten and people were passing down that road, who would you want to see you as a neighbor? And you know what's interesting? Whenever we're the ones passing down the road and we see the person in need, we want to pull out our application form. Have you lived? What have you done? Did you get in this mess all on your own? Did you make some big, awful, terrible mistakes? Have you ever hurt me? Are you one of my enemies? Have you treated my family? Are you one of us? Are you not one of us? And we're going to get the application out in triplicate, social security number. We're going to do a background check, fingerprints. That's when we're the ones who are looking at the other person and we're the ones passing down the road. But when we're the ones laying on the side of the road having been beaten, robbed, stripped, half dead, in danger of dying, when somebody comes along and says, can I help? Well, hold on here, wait a minute. Um, I, I'm not sure, are you my neighbor? 
Because if you're not my neighbor, I don't want your help. Is that how we act in those cases? Absolutely not. In those cases, whoever extends the hand of mercy and compassion will accept it. We're not going to have the application then. And that's the point that Jesus is making for us. I don't know, lawyer. Who would you want to be your neighbor if roles were reversed? Frankly, I'll be honest with you. I wish Jesus had just said, here's the ten people you have to love. But that's not what he says. What he says is, who would you want to love you when you're the one that needs the love? How will you prove to be a neighbor? Who do you love? Who do you love? How are you doing at this? If you'd like to, you can put your notes away and pull your songbook out now. We're going to be singing number 274, Softly and Tenderly. If you're like me, this story is not at all the answer that you want to the question. And we are going to talk later on in the week about boundaries and priorities, and we're going to recognize the practicality. I can't love everyone in the whole world, at least not fully, not actively. I just don't have enough time in the day and enough resources. So we're going to talk about some priorities and boundaries, but I really don't want to, I mean, I'm telling you that because I don't want you walking out tonight saying, well, can't do it, might as well not come back. But I also don't want you walking out tonight saying, oh, good, fine, on Thursday night, he's going to tell us who the actual people are we really have to do this for. I I don't want you doing that either. We got to sit with this challenge. And it is a challenge. And it's a frightening challenge. And it frightens me because I know that I so often fail in this challenge. I remember the very first time I preached this series. I was up in Brownsburg, Indiana. It was a part of our fall focus. We did it over an entire month. We were focused on this. All these lessons were presented. And it was done. And I know some of you have been in Indiana. Some of you, uh, some were telling me about growing up in Indiana. You might remember that in Indiana, there's this stuff in the winter. I know a lot of you don't know about this stuff. It's, uh, it's white, and it falls from the sky. It's kind of frightening if you've never seen it before. It's called snow. And some of the winters there in Brownsburg, Indiana, there's a lot of it. And it gets on the road, and it gets hard to drive. And one day, I was at, um, I, was at I think I was at Starbucks studying, trying to meet some people. And, and I looked at my watch, and, oh, it's lunchtime. i got to get home to lunch. So I hopped in my car, and I pulled out, and it, it was really... To get home, it was about six, one half of the other, dozen the other. I could turn right or I could turn left. Either way would get me home. So I was going to turn left behind this car, and all of a sudden their wheels started spinning. I thought, oh, you got to be kidding me. I dropped it down into four-wheel drive, went over to the right lane. Okay, I'll turn right. Don't you know that their car slid all the way across <laughs> right in front? And I thought, well, i got to get home for lunch. And I pulled out and got in between, and I went around them. And I went home, and I got home for lunch. And as I was pulling around them, I saw my daughter worked at the Chick-fil-A that was right there. I saw her boss coming out of the Chick-fil-A to help push this guy off. And all I could think of was, by chance, a preacher passed by (laughs) and drove on the other side of the road. And I was the guy who just preached all those lessons. I thought, ah! It's tough. It's a challenge. And that's why one of the things that I'm having to remember is that Jesus did not tell this story to tell you or me. If you want to get to heaven, you better love perfectly or you're going to hell. 
In fact, as we think about that, what this story does is it sets it on a plane that causes me to realize what I learned this morning. Is that in this story, who am I? I'm the one that's beaten on the side of the road dead. And who is Jesus? He's the one despised and rejected. He's the Samaritan that came and lifted me up and has paid for my healing. Now that doesn't mean that I dispense with the story and say, oh good, I don't have to love anybody. What that does is that caused me to say, I want to love more like him. I want to love more like him. I promise you, if you walk away from this story with the idea that I'm only going to make it to heaven if I love better, you're not ever going to make it to heaven. You're not going to love that much. But if you walk away from this story remembering there's one who loves me, and I'm going to let that change me to be more like him, he'll get you there. And so on the times that you've messed up, rather than giving up, Turn back to Him. He's picking you up. He's paying the price. He loves you. Will you let Him? And that's such a sad thing because in the sermon, I mean, I hope you picked up on it. I was trying to make it a little bit humorous, the idea of the the, the man on the side of the road pushing the guy's help away. I'm not sure if you're my neighbor. That was kind of, I hope it was kind of humorous, right? Nobody would ever do that, right? And yet, actually people do it all the time as Jesus comes along the road and stretches out His hand and says, I'll help. People knock His hand away all the time. Don't don't be one of those. He is calling softly and tenderly. He is reaching out His hand. He went to the cross and died for you. Won't you let Him lift you up? Pay for your sins. Wipe them away. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Will you surrender to him and let him save you? We're going to stand up to make it easier for you to step out in the aisle. When we stand up, if you want Jesus' blood to save you from your sins, we'll invite you to come right down here as we stand and sing. So-